All right, it's time to move on to the indirect method of the statement of cash flows. So you can see that there's a fundamental difference here between the direct and the indirect. The direct kind of has a saying, okay, well, where did I get my money from? From my customers, where did I spend my money? And in all of these areas, and how much money did I have flow in or flow out from operating activities? And of course, in this last question, I had an inflow, not an outflow, but an inflow of 164 grand in flow with a W. Um, so the indirect method says, okay, well, let's net income, 90% of the transactions involved in generating net income are involving cash, just cash coming in and going out to pay expenses and to collect from customers. Um, so let's start there and work backwards. We'll back out anything that doesn't involve cash. So our net income was 136 grand and let's start there and you can see it actually does a pretty decent job if i just had the the net income and didn't consider anything else i'd be like you know 20 grand off like pretty close right net income gets us pretty close to where we need to go for many many companies and this this one is uh no exception however there are uh other items it says adjustments to reconcile net net income to net operating cash and it kind of cut off the word cash so amortization expense uh, i need to say to myself okay let's look at our uh, expenses and of course among these operating expenses of 135 grand was amortization of 64,000. or sorry where's the amortization depreciation pardon me uh depreciation of 12 grand I've used the terms interchangeably. I'll change it on this sheet because it says amortization, but of course we've been calling it depreciation. Okay, so I need to say to myself, uh, well, why, why am I looking at depreciation here? Well, the answer is it's included in net income, right? Uh, that depreciation of 12 grand got us down to our 136, but it didn't involve cash. So. I start with net income and then I work backwards for all the things that didn't involve cash or were included in the wrong section and depreciation is one of them, right? Depreciation was critical to us getting to our number of 136. It's 12 grand that was included in this operating expense. If I take out the depreciation here, the operating expenses are 12,000 lower and our net income would be 12,000 higher. So what we need to say is yes, net income simulates cash flow, but it shouldn't include depreciation. So whatever that net income number is, add back the depreciation. I add it in. And you might say, well, wait a minute, depreciation gets deducted. These reconciling items, it's almost like opposite day. If I think it's an expense and I think, oh, I deduct expenses, we add it back. Why do we do the opposite? Because we're reconciling, we're working backwards here. Same with gains and losses on sales of assets. You might think, oh, a gain, I add that. No, we deduct gains and we add losses. And let's, let's look at our loss here. We had a loss. It says the loss on sale of equipment, 9,000. Uh, that was included in my expenses. But of course, as we, we mentioned in the, the previous part of the video, uh, losing on a sale of equipment, first of all, it adds to your cash because you sold equipment, so presumably you sold it for some cash. But that loss on sale of equipment should not be dealt with in the operating section. It's uh, Selling equipment is a non-operating item. So the fact that I've got it included in my net income, something that is really an investing activity, means I've got to get it out of there. So it's included in net income. we got to get it out of there. It was a loss of 9000 so we add it to say, oh, I want to reverse the effect of this on my net income. Uh, we didn't have any investments and we didn't have any goodwill to amortize. Uh, change in prepaid rent. Did we have any prepaid rent? I don't believe so, but we did have taxes payable. Yeah, there's no prepaid rent in my assets, but there's tax payable. It fell from 11 to 10. I need to say to myself, okay, what effect would a payable falling have? Well, if a payable falls from 11 to 10, it, it goes down by a grand. Why would it go down by a grand? Because I paid it. So we would that would be a negative $1,000 impact to my cash. A payable falling, of course, is bad for cash. Changes wage, change in wages or salaries payable. We didn't have any wages or salaries payable. We did have salaries expense, but no salaries payable. Uh, change in accounts receivable. We definitely did have that. Let's see. Accounts receivable went from 50 to 64. I need to say to myself, is this good for cash or bad for cash? This is bad for cash. Uh, think about the counter example. If accounts receivable is falling, it means we're collecting our money. Accounts receivable rising 
means we're not collecting our money. We're not collecting what's owed to us, and that's bad for cash. So 50 to 64, this harms our cash flow by $14,000. It's going to be a negative 14. Change in inventory. Inventory went down by 30 grand. This is very good for cash. And again, think of the counter example. If inventory goes up by 30 grand, it means we're spending more money on our inventory, uh, more cash tied up in inventory. Inventory decreasing means we have less cash tied up in inventory, more cash in our pocket. So always a good thing to reduce inventory. Uh, you know, in a, all else equal, you would rather be running a company with less inventory than more because less of your money is tied up in inventory. So this is good for your cash flow, 30 thousand dollars to the good change in prepaid insurance we didn't have uh oops let me just go back to this uh i don't see any prepaid insurance uh next change in office supplies i didn't see change in accounts payable i definitely did see uh accounts payable where are you uh, there you are, it's circled uh accounts payable fell from 40 to 32 accounts payable going down well, why, why does it go down? Because we paid it. So that's bad for cash. Cash goes down by eight grand. Change in interest payable. I didn't see any interest payable. We definitely had interest expense, but no interest payable. Uh, okay, so that's fine. Uh, and change in other liabilities. Well, let's see. Counts payable is a liability dealt with it. Income tax payable is a liability dealt with it. Our only other liability is a bank loan. Uh, and I know that that does not belong in the operating section. What I'm looking for is other current liabilities that may need to be dealt with here. Uh, absolutely not bank loan though. Bank loan is a financing activity. It's a long-term debt activity. So that's it. Uh, let's add up this list. So I'm just adding my way down here. I hit enter and oh my goodness, oh happy day, Kalu Kale, it matched. You should feel very good about that. Now, I, I want to take a step back here and I, maybe I'll explain the, the, these two items. Of course, our, our net inflow from operating is 164 grand, but what we've just done here is a little bit perverse. No company is ever going to do both of these. A company will choose to do the direct or the indirect method. We've chosen to do both because this is an academic exercise. So I say to myself, oh, I'm so happy they matched. Yes, both methods landed me in the same place, which they should and they must. But no company in no real world situation are you going to have that feeling, right? Balance sheet balancing. Absolutely. I've done lots of big company balance sheets and they like don't balance sometimes, which is crazy. I know it sounds like, oh, these are professional organizations. Well, it's just a matter of your schedule is working properly and making a balance sheet balance is a good feeling when you're a professional accountant or a professional auditor as I was. Um, however, this moment never happens in practice. You don't say, oh, my direct method matched my indirect method. Yay, I feel so good. No, no, no. This is just something we are doing. We can feel good about because we, we found that, yes, our direct and indirect methods matched as they should have, but this is not a real thing that an auditor or an accountant does. However, I think it's important that you know that they both work. They both get us to the same place. There's no difference between the two in terms of the total, but the information provided is very different. I prefer the information provided on the left side here. I think the direct method provides better information. It says, here's where my money came from and here's where I spent it, right? The information on the right side says, okay, here's what my net income was and now we're gonna work backwards. <laughs> And it gives you kind of backwards facing information. As a student, I would like the indirect method better. I would hope my prof assigns me because I think it's easier. As a prof or somebody that's just interested in good information, I think this provides much better information. Now, why do standard setters say, oh, this is better, but you can do either? Well, that's probably up for debate. Why, why we're allowed to do both, uh, it's actually beyond me. I think standard setters could say, just do it this way or don't do it this way. But the fact that they're kind of sitting on the fence is a little bit odd to me. Um, okay, so we have completed the indirect method. In the next video, we are going to move on to our 
uh, investing, and perhaps even our financing section. We'll see how we're doing on time, but we'll definitely do the investing section in the next video.